Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Miss Shelved, your bi-weekly dose of book love. I'm your host, Nicole Brinkley, here as always to introduce you to a fabulous independent bookseller and an author they love. This week, our penultimate episode for season one, our independent bookseller is the wonderful Pia Ladina. Hi, my name is Pia Ladina, and I am known as the book lady at Turning the Page Books in Monroe, Connecticut. Pia's enthusiasm is contagious. It's hard not to get excited when she does. So when she mentioned who she wanted to talk to, who is an author illustrator I already admired, I knew it was going to be a good conversation. Pia is talking to the extremely talented Jerry Kraft. Hi, I'm Jerry Kraft, and I am the author and illustrator of New Kid and Class Act. New Kid is the winner of the 2020 John W. Newbery Medal, as well as the Kirkus Prize, and I'm also very fortunate to receive the Coretta Scott King Author Award. Settle in and listen as these two talk about the power of graphic novels, reading as a passion, and how comic books can teach you just as much, if not more, than a traditional novel does. Jerry, I have to tell you, when you introduced yourself, I literally had to stop myself from cheering when you rattled off all of the awards because I am so happy that New Kid won all of those things. It is about time that a graphic novel got the accolades that it so richly deserved. That was a brilliant book. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. You know, it's so funny that, you know, I hear these things and then I don't always. I guess because we've been on lockdown so long, it's it's been so long since I've like <laughs> talked to real people. You right. Know? And it's just interesting that sometimes I forget until I like read off my bio. I was like, hey, wait a minute, I did do those things. That's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah, you really did do those things. It it is one of those things where, you know, as you're making the rounds and as you're seeing kids in bookstores and signing books and seeing authors and colleagues, it's got to be such a huge rush. An honor like the Newbery Award is, it's, it's a pinnacle. And yet this is one of your first big books, right? That's got to be an amazing feeling. It's so weird because... I've been doing books, so I self-published my first book in 1997. Right. And I started my own publishing company because I just could not get published. And some of the rejection letters I got were so foul that I was like, you know what? This industry is never going to open up to someone like me. So I started my own publishing company. And Good for you. I, yeah, I worked with about a dozen different authors over, you know, since 97 and had a hand in publishing about three dozen books. And it really wasn't until 2014 that I got an email from Scholastic asking if I wanted to illustrate a book from them, for them. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was being pranked. You know, I thought it was <laughs> Impractical Jokers or something. Oh no, that's terrible. Yeah, because I just never thought that the opportunity would arise. I mean, when I tell you I had given up, but not not like, you know, with my tail between my legs and that kind of thing, because I was still creating the book that I, I liked, but I just didn't think that the opportunity of having a career that was anything but self-publishing would ever happen. Wow. Wow. And look where you ended up. This This is not so bad. Yeah, I'm not doing too bad. No, I think you're okay. I think you're okay. Did you ever imagine when you were a kid that this is what would happen? No, not at all. And the reason, and this is the thing that always kind of surprises people, is I was not a book reader. I didn't enjoy reading. It was boring and it always put me to sleep. If I ever wanted to go to sleep, I'd grab a book and I'd be out in a couple of minutes. And I think there's a lot of psychological stuff that was the cause of that because early on you know i was always a comic guy i was a marvel comic guy but when you have enough adults telling you that comics are dumb and they'll rot your brain and they're not real reading then early on i was like you know what apparently fun reading is illegal and real reading is you know you had to read T.S. Eliot or 
Dickens or right. you know something like that. Right. You have to read and the classics. The classics. Yeah. And those books, they just didn't interest me. There were very few of the classics that I read. You know, A Long Day's Journey into Night, I enjoyed for whatever reason. I mm-hmm. still remember that. And Great Expectations by Charles Dickens was the first book of that size. Like we're talking like a 300 page book right. that I ever finished. And I was stunned that I actually did finish it. I don't know if you know this, Jerry. I was a school librarian before I became the owner of my bookstore. And I I have seen this incredible surge in literature, in kid lit, over the last 15 years. I really, truly believe that the books that we consider to be classics now would not be considered classics if the type of writing that's happening in the last 15 to 20 years had been happening when the writing that is called classic writing was accompanied by the writing that's going on today, right? If you think about it, what, what we consider the classics, and yes, there are many that are unbelievably good. Right. But when I have folks come into the bookstore right now, and they want to share the things that they remember from their childhood as the best books that they read. And they want to give those to their kids. And they want to say, oh, I want to give this to my child because I remember it so fondly. It just pales in comparison with some of the amazing books that exist now. I don't know that the classics actually would really be considered classics if everything that exists on shelves today existed then. Wow. So I am going to kind of, maybe I'm nodding my head in agreement because, you know, people like to pick on people. So (laughs) I will let them pick on you. (laughs) However, maybe I'm nodding my head in agreement, probably, especially when you think of me as an African-American male. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone that looked like me in one of those classic books was not having a good day. No. You know what I mean? Like, nope. there are no instances of someone who looked like me of really being happy or making it to the end of the book or having their family intact for the whole book. You know what I mean? It it was just, it was not a good time for us. If If we talk about representation, if we talk about kids being able to see themselves in books. There's a huge portion of the population that not only couldn't see themselves, but if they did see themselves, they weren't happy with what they were seeing. Right. So now imagine, okay, so for everyone listening, imagine like when you get a Harry Potter or Percy Jackson or one of Rainer's books and you're like, I believe in this character, this character's me. Now imagine never having felt that. The fact that I wasn't a reader wasn't really rare for kids like me, you know? Because yeah. you know, what was what was the option? That makes an awful lot of sense. Yeah. I actually had a kiddo come into my bookshop and she was a former student of mine. And she said to me, you know, Mrs. Ladina, it's really sad that there aren't any books about gay kids. And I said, oh, so-and-so, have I got a surprise for you? And I literally walked her over to an entire selection of books that were strong, representative, fabulous, character-rich books. Some of them were adventures. There was one that was a fantasy. There was one that was a romance. And and I could show her these books. And she hadn't found them yet. But the fact that books existed where she could find somebody who felt the thing she was feeling was such a powerful thing for her that it was phenomenal. And she left with a stack of books. So it makes me so sad that you did not have that as a kid. Now, not only didn't I have the book, but I didn't have a you. Yeah. I didn't have someone 
to take me by the hand and say, hey, Jerry, look at this book about an African-American family, you know, like a Renee Watson book or yeah. that kind of thing where I can look at and go, wow, wait a minute. They actually yeah. are happy and they made it to the end of the book and everyone's still alive. And wow. You know, so basically I read Spider-Man comics. So I had more in common with Peter Parker, you know, Spider-Man. Right. Than I did with any African American character that I ever saw in the book. Wow. For those of you who are listening, I'm a white girl. <laughs> I am middle aged at this point, although it hurts me to say it. In fact, this is probably the longest conversation I'll have with a grown up in weeks, right? <laughs> because I too am relatively isolated, with the exception of the folks that come into the bookshop. And I just don't talk to grownups all that much. I mostly talk with kids. But, you know, I find it fascinating, especially in the last year, with everything that's been going on in our communities and society at large. I'm so happy to be able to talk to you just as a person because I find it so interesting to talk to people who have experiences other than my experience. And I think overall, we would all be in a much better place if we just did that. And I think that books are one way that we can do that. Yeah. If we can't have the conversations, then at least we can read the books. Right. And that's one of the reasons that in my bookshop, I have extremely diverse shelves, even though I'm not in a, an extremely diverse town. And the folks that are in my town love that because they recognize that they're not an extremely diverse place and they want to actually read stories about everybody. And they want their kids to see people who are other than they are, who have had experiences other than they have. And I think that that's really, really important. And that's one thing that I tried so hard. So my goal with doing both New Kid and Class Act Mm -hmm. is creating African-American characters that were so likable that you would feel empathetic for them. You'd feel empathy. And I feel as a rule that even if you like books that have African-American protagonists, I don't know if you feel that empathy like you are mm -hmm. going through it like you feel what they feel right you know if jordan is happy you're happy if jordan said you're sad because right. so many of the books are so far removed from your life right just like reading t.s Eliot <laughs> or right. faulkner was so removed from <laughs> my life Right. Dostoevsky, you know, not right. really recognizing the commonalities there. Right. You know, I'm not reading the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock going, <laughs> yeah, that's me. Right. right. You know? Yes. So even if you are sad if they die at the end or if this happens, it's not the same as if you're reading Hunger Games and you're like, right. I am this character. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Prim is just like my sister. Right. So I don't think that you see that because, you know, you don't think in terms of like police brutality as something mm -hmm. necessarily a day to day thing for you. You don't have grandparents who had a drink out of a white drinking fountain. My dad mistakenly drank out of a white drinking fountain in Texas. So that's not 300 years ago. That was my dad. I'm one generation removed from that. If you're reading a book about the quote unquote runaway slave, and there are many books like that. And again, these are all important books. Yes. But can you, as a white woman, really feel the empathy and like you're in the situation of a reality that is so far removed from you? And I don't think that there are enough books where you get to be the character. And so I really put in my due diligence to make Jordan and Drew as two characters that 
you know, if they stub their toe, I want you to start rubbing your foot because you feel it. You know? <laughs> well, I think you totally nailed it because when I'm talking about new kid to the kiddos who come in my bookshop, whether they know about it or not, I get goosebumps just from thinking about the title because even the title encapsulates exactly the feeling that any kid feels when they go to a new school, but also when they grow through something. Right. And I use the phrase grow through something intentionally because mm -hmm. to me, you hit it in both ways. That is not something about color. That is something that any child, any person really can empathize with. And then when you add the essential layer of race and how when he walked into the school, everyone had what looked like a dress code that he just didn't understand and just didn't get. And you see his sort of transition from where he was living over the course of his train ride into how he needed to dress when he got to school. Like those things, both in the visuals of the graphic novel and also how his thought process was transpiring, it just was absolutely unbelievable to me. Oh. It was absolutely stunning. And, you know, for me, I've always been interested in Marvel Comics. I was never someone who went running out to grab them. But I have to say, graphic novels for myself are not my preferred format for a book. New Kid changed that for me. Wow. I never really got it. I would fight for my students and I would fight for my kids in the bookshop because I believe that for any, any kid, whatever they want to read is what they need to read. It, it doesn't matter to me. They can read a cereal box. If that's what they want to read, then that is reading. And if someone is going to become a lover of books and that's what it takes to get them there, then that is what I'm going to fight for them to have. My sons are 22 and 20. And when they were younger, and I mean, they still are, but they were gamers. And I made sure that we subscribe to Game Informer magazine. So every week, you know, every month or whatever, when that magazine came out, their nose was stuck in that magazine. And they knew when the new Sonic was coming out, who the publisher was, who this, who the design, I mean. And so I fed them. And there are parents and teachers would have not only been like, the video game magazine is stupid, but that games are stupid. So you lose the kid when you show them that what they like just has so little significance for you. Yep. Yep. Or it doesn't even count. Doesn't There's even. no value. Right. And whenever you don't respect a kid's interests, that is telling a kid that you don't respect them. Right. And yeah. that I, I can't let happen. There have been times where I have gone toe to toe with teachers or colleagues or carefully with parents, right? Because I feel strongly enough that I want to explain it to them, that if a child wants to read something, anything, that's good. Right. Let them encourage it because there's always a way that that is going to expand. Right. And see, that's what people don't get. You know, so if you have a kid who is reading, say, one of Raina's books, it's probably a much easier transition to go from one of Raina's books to a prose book yep. than it is to just go from playing Xbox one day to pick up a book. And, and so many parents kill that desire to read because, you know what, okay, and that happened to me. Well, I didn't read. You know what? When that Atari came out, all that spare time that would have been reading went to playing the Atari. Yep, absolutely. You know? 
If you had options, you would find those. That was okay, too. You turned out all right, Jerry. (laughs) So I turned out okay. (laughs) You did. You did. And now the kind of cool thing is that I have a, a couple of really awesome series in my bookshop that are choose your own adventure books, but they're done in the style of a graphic novel. And they are like panels of a video game. We can get them in baby steps, right? So mm-hmm. we can take them from whatever video game they're looking at to a choose your own adventure book that is done in screens where you pick one screen on a page to another screen on a page based on what choices you're making to a regular graphic novel, to a highly illustrated novel, to a regular novel. I can get you there, but we have to let the kids know that in order to get that first step, that it's okay. Right? That whatever they choose is going to be okay. Right. There's a phrase that people use out there, you know, a dessert book, or this book is for fun, but this is a real book. We got to stop that. (laughs) All reading is reading, all books are books. And now here's the other thing as a fellow Marvel person, so even the titles, Mm -hmm. right? The Uncanny X Men. The Incredible Hulk, The Spectacular Spider-Man, Tales to Astonish. There were words like Annihilation Mm -hmm. and Armageddon. So by the time... You've got some serious vocabulary there. You've got some serious vocabulary there. So by the time it was time for me to read Dickens, I could read it, you know, because my vocabulary was pretty good. Now, we're they missed out was they didn't give me the books that I then wanted to read. Mm -hmm. So that's where I could have definitely used a U. That's where I could have used a Kwame Alexander or a Jason Reynolds or a Renee Watson or Eric Velasquez, Elizabeth Acevedo. You know what I mean? That could have brought me in as opposed to some other book where the character just wasn't going to have a good day. (laughs) Right. Because we need to see everybody in the everyday, not just in those high pressure, high intensity situations. And that's, that's starting to happen now. I'm really excited about that. And I'm really excited to see so many different authors coming out and writing these magnificent stories, it's amazing to me. I, I get to unpack all of these boxes. It is absolutely magical to see the, the work that is being done right now across grade levels and age levels. As much as I appreciate it, like when people say, wow, New Kid was such a groundbreaking book. We haven't seen anything like it. You know, thank you. But at the same time, it's 2020. Yeah. It shouldn't be groundbreaking. A black kid going to a predominantly white private school really shouldn't be groundbreaking. No, it really shouldn't you be. Know? I actually did a book group in the beginning of the summer. I ended the summer with New Kid. They got it. They totally got it. But it's fascinating to me. Right. And my thing is, you know, you look at characters in our lifetime Mm -hmm. black characters specifically Mm -hmm. that have transcended all kinds of boundaries and to me literally the only one i can think of is fat albert and that was like 50 years ago but it wasn't that's a black cartoon it's like hey it's fat albert and i always stump people like okay so after fat albert now not a superhero so you can't say black panther but who's next who's the most iconic black character from you know book or yeah especially books Mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing or even tv there's no peanuts harry potter and that was what i set out to do because i knew that there was such a desert for it you know and now i did a zoom with kids in new zealand who identify with jordan banks and i'm like kids from new zealand you know they're like i'm just like drew or i'm like jordan i'm like Wow. That's cool. It, it is so cool. It gave it gives me goosebumps. You know, their parents send me pictures of them. 
they sneak pictures and the kid is at the dinner table reading the book under the table or in bed reading it or under the covers and like they haven't put the book down. They've read it two times or three times or four times. I have to say, I have so enjoyed our conversation and I can't believe that we're actually just about out of time. I'm Pia Ladina. I'm the book lady at Turning the Page Books. Our website is turningthepagebooks.com and you can find me also at booklady24.7 on Instagram or at ttpbookct on Twitter. Jerry, you want to hand over some information so that everyone can find you? Everything is pretty easy for me. So whether it's Facebook, Instagram, my website, everything is just Jerry Craft. So Jerry Craft on Twitter, website is jerrycraft.com. Instagram, wherever, just Jerry Crow. Everybody out there, thank you so, so much for listening. It has been an absolute pleasure spending some time with you today. If you liked today's episode, don't forget to rate, subscribe, and tell a friend about Miss Shelved. To keep up to date with all of our bookish hijinks, follow us at Miss Shelved Pod on Twitter and Instagram. If you really like what happens here, and we hope you do, head over to our Patreon page to help fund this podcast and our Michelle newsletter. Thank you for listening, and as always, happy reading. <laughs>